So what are you doing personally? Daily. You know, I try to keep a healthy weight. I do intermittent fasting, uh, which is pretty easy because I'm so busy I forget to eat. How many hours do you give yourself every night? Uh, well, I suffer from uh, late night snacking, but I try to skip breakfast and, and even skip lunch if I'm busy. So I'm a night eater. Um, but that seemed to be good because a, a study came out about a couple of weeks ago, at least in mice, that it's not what you eat, it's when you eat that's most important for longevity. What's well, the best? I, it doesn't actually matter uh, if you eat a lot in the morning or a lot at night. I like nighttime eating. But you need a period during the day, at least if you're a mouse, probably if you're a human, where you're hungry. Um, and that puts your body in a defensive mode. And what are the processes that diet and exercise do for us that keep us healthy? And why does calorie restriction and intermittent fasting make animals live so much longer? And we think we've figured out a large part of how that works. And now we're mimicking that with molecules. Um, is the is the idea that you can mimic it with molecules and it will be as effective as intermittent fasting? I think the molecules will be better. Um, and not only that, when we add them on to a healthy diet and exercise in the animals, they do even better. It's like a supercharged mouse. Now, when you add them on to the mice, do you also add them on with intermittent fasting? And is there an additional benefit? Uh, we do. We do. If we give our latest molecule called NMN uh, to a mouse and we exercise it, it'll run even further than it could with either of those alone. So it's not an excuse to sit around and just eat chips and watch TV. It augments a healthy lifestyle, gets you further than what you could get naturally. So are you seeing a benefit in addition? So is the idea to compound all those things together? Exactly. Right. So you asked about myself. So I, I do, I eat healthy. I try to skip meals. Uh, I also take supplements. Um, and in fact, most of my colleagues are in the field of aging, or anti-aging, as, as people call it. Uh, so I take NMN every morning. What is NMN? When you when you put more of these genes into a yeast cell or, or a mouse, they'll live longer, between uh, five to twenty percent longer. And so we think that these genes are responsible for the effects of dieting and exercise, which is great. Which what that means is we can now mimic that with molecules. So NMN is one of those molecules. So is resveratrol. You can think of resveratrol as the accelerator pedal for the sirtuin genes and the NMN is the is the fuel and without fuel resveratrol won't work so NMN is the, the gas in the how many milligrams are you taking of these things uh, so yeah NMN is is um, something I, I get from for myself I'm not selling anything so I take a gram of NMN in the morning based on clinical trials it's been shown that that will raise NAD with or without food um, I take a little bit of yogurt that I make myself at home so in the yogurt, it'll dissolve. Take another half a gram of resveratrol. And how much? Uh, half a gram? Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a powder. I have a few kilos left over from clinical trials in my basement. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's going to last me a few decades. Uh, and then I also take at night some metformin, which is probably the most radical thing that I take, which is a, a prescribable drug for diabetes. Metformin? Met. Met. M? M-E-T. And prescribable drug. So you, but you don't have diabetes. I do not. But you take it for, for preventing cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, and aging. Met for, can you spell it? M E T F O R M I N. Uh, and so, out of studies of ten thousand people and more, it's been shown that people who take metformin, even if, even if they have diabetes, are protected against other diseases of aging, even frailty. And so, m most scientists, if you ask them in my field, will say, "Yeah, metformin." is likely to extend your lifespan. It's just that the FDA doesn't let you have it for aging because aging isn't a disease yet. So do you have to get diabetes to get it or do you have to get a sneaky doctor? Well, I wouldn't call it a sneaky doctor, but the doctor typically has to be convinced because they don't keep up with the literature. And right. it, it's, it's off label. Okay. Right. And how much do you take of that? Uh, I take a gram of that yeah. as well, which is about a, a low dose. Uh, some diabetics take two grams, so it's not crazy amounts. Is there any side effects? Well... The good news is that it's extremely rare that you get sick from any of these molecules. Um, in millions of patients around the world, nobody's getting sick. The worst you'll have, as far as I can tell, is a stomach upset. Um, and I get that, which is actually helpful. If I'm hungry, I, I lose my appetite. But uh, I, I think the downside is extremely low. And the, the upside is you know, anything's better than what's coming. And what is the mechanism that metformin is operating under? Okay. 
So that so this is the great thing is that over the last 20 years we have figured out we scientists have figured out that there are universal regulators of aging from yeast to worms to mice and in humans. And there are three main pathways that we figured out respond to what we eat and how we exercise. And one of them is called AMPK. Uh, and this is a, a target of metformin. And so I'm active when I take metformin, I'm activating my AMPK, which will send out the troops. Uh, the sirtuins I've mentioned, that's the second of the pathways. And so I take NMN and resveratrol for that. And then the third one is called mTOR, which is a pathway in the body that responds to how many amino acids, how much meat you're eating. Uh, and it will also protect the body if you tweak it just the right way. And there's only... Besides eating low amounts of protein, the only way to, to affect that pathway is with a drug called rapamycin, which is, which is a little dangerous to try and is, is used for uh, immunosuppressants. So it's not oh. something that I would recommend, um, and I don't take it. This is your daily routine along with what, what kind of like diet do you follow? Well, I, I try to not eat too much. It's pretty easy to overeat, so I try to skip one or two meals a day. Um, I avoid sugars and carbs. Uh, I try to run once a week. I do workouts on the weekend. Uh, like you, I, I love saunas. I like to put my body in some temperature stress, so I go heat, and then I jump in a cold bath, mm. back and forth. That that works well for yeast. We can do that in the lab, and they, they live 30% longer. So old theories about aging, you got to throw them out. Most people at parties will tell you, oh, antioxidants, free radicals, DNA damage or mutations, that is all, for the most part, incorrect. That antioxidants cause DNA damage? No, that's that, true. That it repairs DNA damage. Well, antioxidants have been a, a rather big failure in the aging field. But resveratrol is an antioxidant, correct? Uh, it's a mild antioxidant, but it doesn't work by being an antioxidant. Oh, what does it work? What is the pathway? Uh, it, it steps on the accelerator pedal of these sirtuin enzymes. Oh, okay. And so it's directly controlling... Uh, the body's defenses against aging. So as we discussed it, or as people discussed it as an antioxidant, it was just a, mi a mild form of antioxidant, but it did so much more. Right. And we know this because if you create a yeast cell or a worm or a mouse, and then you knock out the gene for the sirtuin, now the resveratrol doesn't help the animal anymore. That's interesting because when people talk about wine, th that's the one thing they say, the resveratrol is an antioxidant. It's really good for you. Yeah, it, this is one of those urban myths that never goes mm. away and still fuels a billion-dollar industry. But what we're finding is that the molecules in plants, like resveratrol, first of all, that we think they're produced by plants because the plants are benefiting from the stress. Uh, we call it hormesis. A little mm. bit of stress is good for you. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger kind of thing. And hormesis was discovered... Oh, about 60, 70 years ago, when people were spraying herbicides on plants, and a little bit of herbicide actually made them stronger. And we think that these molecules in plants are similar. They make the plant stronger during times of stress. So if you stress a grape that's for wine making, you'll get great wine, but you'll also get a lot of resveratrol. And so when we ingest that resveratrol from the plants, we get the same health benefits because the plants are activating their sirtuin pathways, and we have the sirtuins, and they activate us as well. Ah, interesting, interesting. So low carb, low sugar, um, any specific type of protein? Do you limit your amount of protein? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I enjoy eating mammals just as much as anybody, but um, I try to avoid them um, for the main, well, two main reasons. One is that uh, there's this TMAO molecule that seems to cause heart disease. Um, TMAO. Yeah. Uh, but the other problem with, with meat in general from, from animals is that there's a lot of amino acids in there, and it's easy to eat a lot of meat. Uh, and so if you have high levels of amino acids, it will activate this mTOR pathway, one of those three longevity pathways, and you don't want that. You don't want that. You don't want that because mTOR has evolved to sense times of adversity and stress and hunger. So why do people see a performance benefit when they consume branched-chain amino acids? Ah, really good question. So in the short run, just like taking testosterone, it will give you performance benefits. But we think in the long run, uh, it'll actually come back to bite you. So how will branched-chain amino acids come back to bite you? So branched-chain amino acids will activate this mTOR pathway. Mm -hmm. um, and when we do that in animals, we actually we reduce their lifespan. So it's the opposite. You want to keep those levels low.